Welcome back to our Dementia Prevention webinar series sponsored by the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute. And today we'll, we will talk about avoiding and treating strokes because stroke is a major risk factor for dementia. And did you know that in Canada, someone suffers a stroke every nine minutes? That means there's more than 60,000 people that have a stroke every year. Unfortunately, many more of us suffer silent strokes. Those are the strokes that you don't feel, but they also do significant damage to the brain. The good news is, is that strokes that we feel are now treatable and the silent strokes are avoidable. So listen carefully today as Dr. Hakim tells us how we can avoid the damaging impact of stroke on our memory function and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Ruth, for your introductory comments. They're very appropriate for what we're gonna talk about today. We're continuing on our, in our effort to understand dementia and how to protect our brain from it. And one of the major causes of dementia that is both now preventable and treatable is strokes. So that's what we're going to focus on today uh, and try to understand uh, how strokes happen and what, how you recognize that either you or a family member is having a stroke, what you do about it and what the system has been now trained to do about it. A stroke occurs most of the time because a blood clot, as you see on this uh, slide, a blood clot is going up towards the brain and eventually meets an artery that is smaller than the blood clot and so there is no blood flowing past the clot at that point and whatever part of the brain depends on that blood flow is now deprived <clears throat> of its blood supply. And if the uh, interruption in blood supply goes on for any length of time, the brain will be irreversibly damaged. As you see here on the CT scan on the left, this patient's stroke was not treated. Here is a very large dark area that represents brain that has been irreversibly damaged. And so um, it became when a treatment became available for stroke, as we will talk in this session, it became very important for everyone to have a simple way of recognizing that a stroke is occurring. So the Heart and Stroke Foundation came up with this mnemonic so that it's easy to remember called FAST. And what it says is F is for face, if the member of your family is saying, suddenly my right side is not feeling right, what you do is you look at their face and if one side is drooping compared to the other, that's a, pos that's a suggestion that a stroke may be occurring. The next thing you do is you say, put your arms up. And so they lift up your arms. And if one of them is falling while the other one is hanging up there, that side, possibly is suffering a, a stroke. And the third thing is speech, which is, does this individual who may be suffering a stroke produce speech normally, or does he or she understand speech normally? And uh, so it becomes, if, if these things, the face is drooping on one side, the arm is not going up on, the, on, on that side or the other side, and the speech is uh, slurred or jumbled or the person doesn't understand speech. The last element is time. Stroke became treatable, but time was of the essence. And so immediately the person needs to alert and call 911 to have an ambulance come and take the stroke. A uh, patient who is suffering a stroke to the appropriate emergency room, which the ambulance and the paramedics will know. The reason we're going into all of this is that when the brain is damaged by a stroke, that is a major driving force towards dementia. Cognitive decline and dementia are present in 61%
of all patients who have suffered a stroke that was not treated within three months from the onset of the stroke event. And the risk for dementia after stroke increases with time. And so it became very, very important to not only be able to identify a stroke, but do something about it. And the reason for that is very simple. In 1995, a drug called TPA was approved for treatment in stroke. And what the TPA does is it simply busts that clot. And so if the clot is all broken up, blood flow comes back to the brain and the brain goes back to normal. So it became suddenly possible to treat a stroke when it first happened, assuming that uh, the, the person with the stroke patient or the stroke person patient himself or herself recognized that this was going on and called 911. It, we spent a great deal of time starting in 2000 with the Canadian Stroke Network to try to change <clears throat> the entire way of taking care of stroke patients. Why? Because I said that the TPA drug was invented in 1995 and approved for treatment in 1995. In the year 2000, less than 2% of stroke patients, five years after this drug was approved, only 2% of stroke patients were actually getting access to this drug. And it became very clear that something need, needed to be done to change the entire system from the patient recognizing the symptoms to the uh, um, uh, paramedics in the ambulance hurrying up to go get the patient when they get the 911 call and to uh, do everything that is necessary to accelerate the treatment of the stroke patient. Because the longer you waited, the worse, the, the less effective the therapy was and the worse the outcome was. So the Canadian Stroke Network, which was formed in the year 2000, got together with the Heart and Stroke Foundation and developed something called the Stroke Strategy, which was intended to make real health system change to facilitate the access of the stroke patient to this new treatment. And so the CSN developed best practice guidelines to provide up-to-date evidence-based guidelines for the prevention and management of stroke. And these guidelines contributed to the health system reform in Canada and internationally. We should be very proud of the fact that this became known as the Canadian model for stroke treatment. And it became uh, basically copied and pasted by a number of other jurisdictions in the world. What did the guidelines say? The guidelines said when a patient, assuming the patient recognized the symptoms and this, there were ads on TV, so people learned what it meant to be having a stroke and what it looked like. And they called 911. The, the paramedics came rushing over, sirens blaring, to pick up the patient with the stroke and take them to the emergency room that is set up to take care of stroke patients because not all emergency rooms had that capacity. And the guideline said, from the minute the patient arrives to the door of the emergency room to being triaged into what path it's going, that patient is going to go down, should take less than one minute. And less than 10 minutes, the doctor should come and evaluate the patient. And less than 15 minutes from the arrival to the door, the stroke team should be notified. And less than 30 minutes to get the first CT scan. Why is that CT scan important? Because not all patients who have suffered a stroke um, are going to require TPA. Some of them will have had the exact same symptoms, but because of a bleed in the head rather than a, a blood clot. And so those patients obviously will not get a, busting, a, a clot busting drug. And door to needle to get TPA from the moment that less than 60 minutes should evolve 
with a CT scan being done with the doctors having seen the patient before the patient would, would get uh, the treatment for the, for the stroke. And so with all of this effort, with all of the meeting with municipal leaders, meeting with uh, paramedics, emergency room physicians, and, and working with educating the public, you can see how gradually the use of TPA, the application of TPA to stroke patients increased. And as I said, not everybody will get TPA. So 42% of stroke patients getting a TPA is probably the maximum. Uh, the others may suffer a, a, a transient ischemic attack and not a stroke, or may have may, the CT scan may show a hemorrhage. So <clears throat> in addition to giving a clot-busting drug called TPA, we've now come a long way in that we can thread a catheter up in that patient, go hook up that clot and pull it, pull it away and suddenly there is blood coming into the brain and that is called a thrombectomy. And in a thrombectomy, it turns out, can be effective for up to 12 hours after the symptom onset. Uh, and um, part of the reason why only 40 some percent of the patients will get TIA and thrombectomy is that a few of them um, naturally through their body's reaction, that little blood clot is going to be busted by their own activity in the brain or the clot is too small and will eventually make it through and the symptoms will disappear and that is called a transient ischemic attack. Typically, the symptoms of a transient ischemic attack will last only a few minutes, 20 minutes, and then completely resolve. Here is the thing, you've been spared this time, but you must do something about that because the next blood clot could be much bigger and cause a stroke. And so if you suffer a transient attack of ischemia to the brain, you must immediately bring it to medical attention. I have been telling you so far about evidence strokes, strokes that the patient feels that the patient's neighbor or family member can recognize and for which there is something to be done. Unfortunately, far more frequently, there are strokes that the patient does not feel. Remember that CT scan that I showed you with uh, the big area of damage? Well, uh, in a covert stroke, we will see something very different. But it's important to recognize that covert strokes, a stroke that is occurring, but the damage is so small that the patient did not recognize it, did not feel it, are occurring very frequently in the population. And they also lead to dementia. And if you look at the MRI scan of a patient who has, of a patient who has suffered many uh, covert strokes, you, we don't see that big area of damage that I showed you with the overt strokes, but you see these little tiny blemishes or stains. These are small arteries that have blocked, and they're not blocking because of blood clots traveling through them, but because of inflammation in the tiny artery, arteriole, that is feeding a small part of the brain. The important thing is that these are just as much productive of dementia as the big strokes that I have showed you. So let's look at who is at risk for developing overt or covert strokes. What are the risk factors? And it's the same risk factors that can lead either to a big stroke happening to small strokes happening that the patient does not feel. And both of these will lead to dementia. Individuals who experience any of the following risk factors are at high risk for suffering a covert or an overt stroke. High blood pressure, and this is a major driving force for strokes, a major risk factor for stroke, and that's why we're gonna talk about it in the next webinar. But cigarette smokers, patients who suffer from diabetes, 
irregular heart rhythm, high cholesterol in their blood, lack of exercise, an unhealthy diet leading to obesity, a previous history of stroke where uh, preventive treatments have not been applied, these individuals can suffer a second stroke or a third stroke. Previous history of a heart attack, history of peripheral vascular disease, the use of illegal drugs, traumatic injury to the blood vessels of the neck, uh, and disorders of blood clotting, all of these risk factors, it's very important to recognize them and treat them because they will increase the chances of the patient suffering from any of these symptoms to be getting either a covert or an overt stroke. So the take home message is stroke is a medical emergency. Learn how to recognize it in yourself or in your family member or in your neighbor. And when you do the fast um, um, testing to see whether the patient may be suffering a stroke, uh, and if they do, then call 911. Don't drive the patient to the hospital yourself because you don't know which hospital to go to. Call 911. They are trained to take the patient, come quickly home, and take the patient to the right emergency room that is trained and ready to take care of the stroke patients. Stroke and transient ischemic attack are major risk factors for dementia, which is why we've dedicated a webinar to it in the setting of understanding dementia better, controlling or treating all stroke risk factors to avoid small and large strokes is incredibly important. And thank you very much. We will now talk in the next webinar about controlling elevated blood pressure. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about resources available to you, please visit our partners at the Dementia Society of Ottawa in Renfrew County. So I'd like to thank Dr. Hakeem for a very interesting and informative webinar, and I hope everyone really enjoyed it. And at this point, I would like to thank our supporters and also acknowledge our partners. So the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute is affiliated with and supported by the University of Ottawa and the associated faculties. We also have over 250 researchers, many of whom come from our partner institutions, including CHIO, the Briere Hospital, the Montfort Hospital, the Ottawa Hospital, and the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research. Finally, I would like to thank the Brain and Mind admin team for all the work and all their production efforts, including Natasha Hollywood, Victoria Rache, Candice Fortier, and Sarah Schock. So thank you so much. And finally, if you have questions for us, or if you have comments, or you'd like to follow us, please go to our website at uottawa.ca slash brain or follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. And many of you are with us today because you have lived experience with dementia. Like many of us, you have family members, friends or relatives that are living with the devastating effects of dementia. And presently, there is no cure. So if you would like to make a difference and make a direct impact on the innovative research that we're doing at the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute, please support our memory and cognition research today by going to the link alumni.uottawa.ca slash brain health. So thank you for being with us and we hope you join us again soon for upcoming webinars.